Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. My name is Nora Sveos. I'm a psychologist. I'm a professor at the University of Oslo and also uh, the chair of the Health and Human Rights Info. And I will share with you today some of our experiences from our work, but also some of the devastating aspects of war, namely sexual violence in war, which is a crime against humanity and it has severe mental health consequences of those who survive. So I will speak about ways in which we can support these survivors. Sexual and gender-based violence in war is as long as history itself. And we know that during every war and every conflict, there are a high number of women being exposed to this form of crime. Very high number, we know from Bosnia, the war, and estimates are between 20 and 50,000 women being raped as part of the war. Also in the Rwandan genocide, we know that the number was extremely high. Also during the conflict in Liberia, very high numbers of women and girls being raped. And the tragic thing is that these violence continues also after the war and after the conflict, and unfortunately still with impunity, meaning that very few responsible for these crimes have been held to account. We know from the Democratic Republic of Congo and all the conflicts there, high number of women, thousands of women being raped during the war from the 1990s. And also in Colombia, violence against women has been a very harsh part of the conflict. So again, these are very tragic numbers. And we know that behind these numbers, there are women, girls, families, societies that have suffered very strongly. And many will also argue that using sexual violence as part of the conflict, as part of a war, is a way also of humiliating the other side, making societies feeling weak and feeble and vulnerable. So of course, we're speaking about a very dangerous weapon. But there's been very few focuses on these things, and I will give some brief examples of this in a moment. So what happens in Ukraine today? Unfortunately, we know that sexual violence as part of the war is happening in Ukraine. We know that women have been raped in front of their children. We hear about allegations of sexual abuse by Russian troops against senior citizens, as well as minors being affected in different places in the country. We know that women have been raped after their men have been killed or abducted. And we have dreadful examples of violations taking place why persons are being seeking protection, which means people who are on the run, either inside the country or crossing borders, have also been exposed to violence of this form and, of course, with serious, serious consequences. We know that Ukraine's Attorney General, Irina Venediktova, has announced the first rape charges against a Russian soldier and the charges about war crimes are being raised in court. Of course, this is little comfort for those who have been exposed, but nevertheless, we know that there may be some work to strengthen uh, the battle against impunity when it comes to these sexual violations. Rape and other forms of sexual violence are fully prohibited in both international and non-international armed conflict, which means that rape, sexual violence in war, is prohibited totally, nationally and internationally. Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions, which is common to all the four Geneva Conventions, says the following, violence to life and person, including cruel treatment and torture, and outrageous upon personal dignity, also including sexual violence, all of this are totally prohibited under the Geneva Convention. And we know the Geneva Conventions are there to protect civilians during war. And it underlines so clearly that these forms of sexual violence in war is totally prohibited. But how was sexual and gender-based violence in war considered before the 1990s? How was it looked upon in different circumstances? And in most cases, abusers were not convicted. And even sexual violence was seen as collateral damages. Soldiers are soldiers, men are men. It happens in all wars. 
it was not considered politically relevant. So nobody was actually placing this important point up on the international agenda. Conflict-related sexual violence was, of course, severely underreported because who would care when international society was not lending their ear to this, these events? There was no documentation or systematic research on these things, and as I mentioned, no part of the human rights agenda. But civil society action, strong voices of civil society, especially feminist movements, and awareness about what was happening, especially in the 1990s, changed the scene, fortunately. So today, there is a focus on sexual and gender-based violence and conflict against women and girls, and there's also a rising concern uh, on sexual violence against boys and men in conflict. We're talking about serious human rights violations affecting people in the most personal and private way. So what happened after the world became aware of gender, systematic uh, gender-based and sexual violence in war? The Security Council, for instance, established a, a panel of experts investigating the, investiga the crimes that took place in former Yugoslavia, which was a very important step. Also, the first Security Council resolution from, from 1992 in the UN also identified massive, organized and systematic detention and rape of women, in particular bus, uh, Muslim women in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And it was all of this described as acts of unspeakable brutality. And an investigation was set forth, set forth. Also, the UN Commission of Human Rights, the Special Rapporteur on Violence, conducted uh, investigations on sexual violence and spoke about it as instruments of ethnic cleansing, which, of course, are very strong words. Furthermore, the, the International Criminal uh, Tribunal which was established for, the, for Yugoslavia in 1993, included rape as a crime against humanity, which made it a very clear crime. It was also discussed as a crime of torture and extermination. And these words had not been used upon these forms of violence before. Also, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda took up the serious uh, sexual violence against women and described that rape constituted a war crime and a crime against humanity. Also, this was repeated. And finally, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, the ICC, from 2002, included sexual violence in its list of crimes against humanity and war crimes. And here, they defined also what do we mean by sexual violence, what is included in the term sexual violence, and this was rape, sexual slavery, enforced prostitution, forced pregnancy, enforced sterilization, or any other form of sexual violence of comparable gravity. Navi Pillai, who was the former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, summarizes the effects of sexual violence in war in her words as follows. Victims of sexual violence bear the cost of harm they suffered with dramatic physical, psychological, and material consequences, which destroy not only their lives, but often also the lives of their children. And this creates irreparable damage to the very fabric of societies and in turn poses serious threats to the prospects of reconciliation and sustainable peace and development. Very good and very precise words summarizing and pointing at the effects, not only on the individual level, but on the family level, on community, and also on the problems involved in reconciling and making peace after so many have been exposed to this form of violence. Among important international efforts that took place around 2000, where the large number of UN Security Council resolutions starting out with the Security Council Resolution 3025 on Peace, Women and Security, which is probably the most famous one. But this was one of the beginning of many, because at this point the world had understood that sexual violence in war was extreme, it was widespread, and it had serious consequences.
So the following resolutions, and I won't go into details about this, but you may look them up uh, at a later point. All of these prohibit very strongly and very directly sexual violence as a tool in war for women, for girls, but also one of the resolutions show to the fact that also men and boys are exposed. And also the resolutions raise the, the importance of rehabilitation, of work and support to victims and survivors, and also to fight impunity against these violations. So when we look at the victims, at the survivors, at those who have experienced the gross forms of violence that we have described, what are their rights? And of course, recognizing sexual violence under international humanitarian and human rights law as a crime of war, as a crime against humanity, implies the right to justice and redress. So in the long run, it is an important fact that these crimes are considered in this way because it ensures and may even provide the survivors with important support and the right to rehabilitation also under international law. It means that the right to redress is enforceable for the victims of gender-based violence according, for instance, to the UN Convention Against Torture, Article 14 of the obligation to provide redress for victims of torture. There are many severe consequences of sexual violence to those who have been exposed. First of all, for the individual survivor, the world is often torn apart. She feels shame. She often feels alone and she feels that she's frozen out of society and community. The violence affects the family and the group, and that may even also be an, in, an intended part of the violence because it has been regarded as sexual violence, as a part of the ethnic, ethnic cleansing. And we can understand so very well how families and groups are affected when mothers, sisters and daughters are being violated in this grueful way. For those who have survived, the presence becomes problematic. How can I live in the here and now when this has happened to me? And also the future seems blurred and often confusing how can I go on? How can I live with my family, my parents, my children, when this has happened to me? Things that they may consider having changed them. Many will fear that their dignity has been taken away from them, that they have no longer a, a place in the community. That's why it's so important for us to understand that we're speaking about crime, we're speaking about intended pain, and we're speaking about ways of dissolving or making societies and communities vulnerable. That's why we as helpers and as civil society groups have a big, big challenge to encourage help and support for those who have been um, exposed and also underline the total prohibition of the acts that they have been through. So we need to know that many communities in the world actually com actively uh, mobilize to support the victims, which is very good to know and we must be part of that mobilization. And then finally, all the children born of rape. And they may also be facing serious consequences. To be, they may be excluded, and they should absolutely not be. They are totally innocent for what has happened. So again, we must mobilize to support, include, provide with the help and rehabilitation and part of the society that the children born under these circumstances have the right to. So there's an urgent need to establish good mental health assistance and support to women, children and men who have suffered sexual violence in war. We must advocate for an approach where mental health, psychological support and somatic care is provided as an integrated assistance. This requires that helpers are prepared and ready to provide such assistance. Because what we need is helpers who are not necessarily experts, but who are prepared to what they will meet and to have some of the tools that they will need to comfort and to support the women or the girls who may approach them. The work should also be based on a human rights principle and have a human rights-based approach. And by this we mean that when we work with sexual violence in war and conflict, we work with severe human rights violations 
it's important that we understand them as such and that our basis and our principles and our approach is also informed by human rights and the human rights values. So in order to strengthen helpers' insights and, and uh, approaches in this work, Mental Health and Human Rights Info has a web page where there's a lot of information easily accessible to all of you, where we have a database with a lot of links, we have thematic pages with very serious and, and important issues in relation to this work. We also have a specific page for our gender-based violence manual, which is a training manual for working with, with the women and men and girls and boys, two different manuals we're speaking about, so that the helpers are prepared when they meet survivors. And also a page approaching you as a survivor. So we would encourage all of you to see, look at this web page for more information. So then what I will speak about now is the Mental Health and Gender-Based Violence Manual, the training manual that the Mental Health and Human Rights Info developed many years ago. And I will describe some of the salient aspect of this manual. First of all, it has a clear human rights-based approach. It's gender-based. It sees gender-based violence as a human rights violation. It is gender sensitive. And it, it, use, it uses throughout a therapeutic metaphor, the butterfly woman, in a way that we can describe both the trauma, the effects of trauma, and also what may be supportive and helping the woman in an indirect and a metaphorical way. Sometimes this is very helpful as an alternative to speaking very directly in cases of such severe violence. The approach is psychoeducative, which means that it explains reactions and ways of thinking and feeling following the trauma. It is resource oriented. It doesn't only speak about the problems, but also about hope, about strength and about possibilities. It deals with the survivors' reactions as well as with the helpers, tools for helpers. It includes a lot of body exercises and, and grounding exercises that may be very useful for the helper to calm and to soothe the person who is in pain. It also discusses how can we help the helpers, how can we be supporting the helpers who are doing such a tough job. And it's also, it has cultural sensitivity and adaptations. And we, of course, encourage also all of you as helpers to see whether there are need to do some cultural adaptations when you use the manual in your work. We did actually translate it in, in conjunction with Alahar, Alahar in, in um, Ukraine into Ukrainian language some years ago. So here you see the presentation of the manual in Ukraine. So, what can be some messages I can give you with respect to meeting survivors, meeting persons who have been victims to these forms of violence in, in, in war? What can we do? What can we say? First of all, it may be important to underline that she has been exposed to a very serious crime. She has been exposed to torture, to a crime against humanity, to a war crime, and that these are totally prohibited human rights violations. They are serious acts of injustice. In some cases, this may help the survivor to feel that she's, she's part of something, or at least that she's not alone, that this is taking place as a part of the war. She does not need to, to explain or to speak. As helper, we do know that she is in deep pain, but you are there for her, respecting her, wanting to be of help, but not push it. She is the one who decides. You must try to establish some trust and to keep some physical distance if possible because you will not want to push or in any way threaten her by being too eager, too talkative or asking for her to explain details that she might find completely impossible to speak about. You can also tell her that she, they have not taken away her dignity or her humanity. Nobody can actually do that. But, of course, they can make you feel very different about these things. They can make you feel that the dignity and my worth is taken away from me. But you must just underline, this is not happening. You still 
people are still have their dignity, they have their humanity, they must just feel it when it comes back. The evil done to her is done to her perhaps to make her feel this way. She may also feel that the control in her life is gone. Her reactions, emotions, and thoughts may be overwhelmingly painful. They are different, and she doesn't feel herself anymore. She's afraid, she's, she's maybe losing her mind, and these reactions frighten her. Some of these descriptions are given in the manual through the metaphor, and later in this webinar you will have my colleague presenting the, de the details of the manual in much more extent to, than I do. So, it's important when these reactions arise that you can also explain that these are feelings that are often happening, that often frequently follow such violence. She may feel f shame and guilt feelings following the violent incidents. And again, you may listen and you may try to reformulate. Never argue, never push. And in order to help her understand that these reactions are expected in a way, we often see them after such violence, violence taking place, it may be good to understand that these are natural or expected reactions uh, following rape. And these, this strategy is called psychoeducation on trauma and trauma reactions. She may also learn about ways of dealing with these reactions, including triggers, which are trauma, trauma reminders, flashbacks, which is feeling that the trauma is happening again, different exercises that may calm her in these situations and you can help her learn new ways in which she may try to calm herself. It is very difficult but it is possible. To do this work you must try to establish a safe place as safe as possible and to communicate that you understand the reactions of the survivor and assure her that you understand that she's in pain. Again, you may try to explain her reactions by saying that these are expected reactions in such violent situations. And you may use some of the tools that we have in the, in the manual, such as the window of tolerance or other metaphors in the butterfly story that we have described already. And this is a way to speak about these traumatic events in a differ different and perhaps a more indirect way. You will also try to calm her by the grounding exercises, working through her body. And finally, we remind you that you must take care of yourself as a helper, and you can actually use some of the same techniques that you use in your collaboration with the survivor. In order to have some good tools as a way of preparing the helper, we have put together a toolbox, a compilation of resources for the helper. Also, the toolbox has been translated, so it's easily and readily accessible. These are not therapy methods in any way, but there are good approaches in your contact with, in your collaboration with the survivor, to help her feel a little more in control and also perhaps less shameful, less guilty, and more in a situation of being understood and to have her dignity, or in the process of working and reworking her dignity, getting it back in her own sensation. I mentioned the window of tolerance. The window of tolerance is, of course, a metaphor. It's a picture that we use a lot when we speak to people who are under stress, who feel high anxiety, to feel that the world is being very different. And they feel that they are very, it's a very limited area in which they can feel that they function well. There's, there takes little of, of new stresses for them to feel overstressed again, and very little for them to feel that they are perhaps just giving up again, that is, under or un, over the window. So the window of tolerance is explained in more details, and you will have it more explained for my colleague but just to mention some of the metaphors and pictures that we can use in our conversations in order to assist and support the survivor. We also need to speak about the triggers, the trauma reminder that I mentioned briefly a couple of minutes ago. The triggers are trauma reminders, that is events or situation that may remind the victimized person of their painful experiences and memories. We know that colors, that sounds, smells, just the look of people who may look alike somebody, for instance, other soldiers who have not been 
harmful, but still they're soldiers, may trigger very strong sensation of anxiety, of fear, of withdrawal. And such reminders may elicit trauma reactions over and over again. So the important thing is to identify what triggers, what are the triggers? What triggers my reactions? What triggers my fear? What triggers my wanting to run home and just pull the carpet over my head? These can be good conversations with the person. And then we have to find ways of dealing with the triggers. How can you establish some kind of control? How can you help them, give them some good tools to assist them in, 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 in strengthening their own dealing with the triggers? For instance, I mentioned already, identify them, becoming familiar them, with them, and also to com become familiar with your own reactions to the triggers. But in some situations, it may be useful to, to, uh, to train yourself to meet the triggers and to deal with the triggers. Other times, it may be useful mostly to, to sometimes take care not to expose oneself to triggers. Again, these are things that are useful to speak about. So there went many ways of stabilizing and supporting the survivors. And stabilization and other useful exercises are used as ways to handle trauma-related reactions, uh, to improve the ability to be present here and now. It's about knowing the effects of trauma, and this may help the survivor better understand their own stress responses, and perhaps also their own strength and their own resources. And knowledge of coping strategies provide a sense of control over these responses. So what is stabilization? It's important for the victim or the survivor to be in the here and now. Because a lot of stimuli, a lot of triggers may bring her back to the trauma, back to the situation that was so painful. So helping her to remain in the here and now is important. So these are some of the tools, approaches that we describe in the manual and that we hope can be of help not only to you as a helper who then has a tool or something to work with, with the survivor, but it may also be a good support to the survivor to, to, uh, to feel more stabilized when the fear is very strong. And one of the methods is through the grounding exercises, which are methods for handling strong emotions of fear or triggers, again with the, with the ambition of becoming more present the here and now, to feel her body, that it's, that it's under her control, it's not under the control of anyone else, and to try to find some safety and some security in their situation. And grounding is one of the ways to reduce reactions or symptoms of anxiety or panic that threaten and overwhelm a survivor. And again, we know that it may sound difficult, but we also know that doing these exercises, teaching the person to try to find ways of doing this by herself or with others may be a support when the anxiety and when the fear comes very strongly back. So with these words, I have tried both to give an overview over the extremely problematic and destructive aspect of this kind of war and war crime. I've tried to give a short historical overview over the development from being something not being cared about to being something which international society is very focused on to try to stop, to prevent, to investigate, to prohibit, and of course to punish. And I've tried to focus on some of the consequences that these acts have on human beings, individuals, as well as groups, and also some useful tools that you can use in your approach to victims of sexual violence in war. And more of this will be said during the, this webinar, and I hope that altogether that this may have given you some insight and some ideas in your extremely important work, and I respect so strongly your efforts and your will to support survivors of different kinds of war crimes.